in the service and I was sitting beside a young lady and her father was a, um, a guest singer in the church and uh, she was beside me and she was listening to him sing and he was singing one of the old um, favorite hymns that we say they're so powerful that he was going um, all hail the power of Jesus name you know that one all hail the power of Jesus name and then he sang the, sec the next stanza, which is, Let angels prostrate fall. And she turned to me and she said, What does that mean? I've heard my dad sing that hundreds of times. What does that mean? Let angels prostrate fall. And I wanted to be silly and say, Well, it sounds like they've had an operation. <laughs> but uh, I explained to her that prostrate means falling forward on your face uh, in worship and praise. And then, of course, the song went on to talk about bring forth the royal diadem, and I could see this blank glaze in her face. She had no idea what was being sung. She was just youthful and didn't understand. There's a lot of hymns that we sing that we don't quite understand entirely. Um, at Christmas, we sing In Excelsis Deo. I'm not sure anybody understands what the Latin meaning is to that. Um, it's not that difficult, but uh, Veiled in Flesh, the Godhood See. These are poetic ways of talking about the Incarnation, of course. Uh, one of the f famous and favorite hymns is, Come Thou Found, but it has this line in it, Here I lay mine Ebenezer. Mm hmm, that means a lot to most people, doesn't it? Ebenezer is a memorial stone, and it's talking about setting up a memorial, but most people don't realize that. Even the hymn, Holy, 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 talks about cherubim and seraphim, or cherubim and seraphim, if we pronounce it properly. And the bulk of people don't realize that those are ranks of angels. Well, each Sunday we sing a hymn, sometimes more, and embedded in those melodies are lyrics with words we don't always understand. How firm a foundation is one hymn, and in it is the, is the line, Sanctify to Thee. Do we understand what is meant by the word sanctification? Hark the herald angels sing. Lyric, God and sinner reconciled. Do we understand what is meant by reconciliation from a biblical viewpoint? There's the hymn, Glorious Day. It's a contemporary hymn. Rising, he justified freely forever. Do we understand what it means to be justified? What is, it, what is meant by justification? Here are some of the things we sing. They're powerful words. They're packed with, with meaning about what God has done and doing for us. But not a lot of people really understand to the depth uh, that they maybe would like what those mean. So this morning, um, I'm revisiting something I started some time ago, uh, developing a series called Big Word Sermons. Big Word Sermons. It's been a while since I've, I've delivered one of these. Uh, big Word Sermons, there's a little graph that I've made up, and it shows you some of the big words that are extracted from Scripture, that... Bible teachers or theologians use. Um, and the Big Word Sermons is intent over time to introduce you to some of these words and to give you the depth of understanding that goes along with them. For example, if you go to our website, you will find there's a couple of messages under this theme, under the topic Salvation, Bridge to Life, and another message from the Peter series called Beyond Big Words. And then there's uh, a sermon that Christiane Dunnick, when she was here, helped me with called uh, the Ragman, and it's all about imputation, another big word, and then predestination, a favorite uh, uh, word of debate amongst the college students, and that's called the predetermined destination. They're there just if you ever want to visit them. But today I, wanted, I want to visit with you one of the most common words that is used in churches, um, and it's also very common in the, used in the Bible, and that is the word redemption. Redemption. How many of you have heard that word before? course, redemption. There's a lot of songs we sing that have the word redemption in it. <laughs> Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Know that one? Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And then the chorus, John? Redeemed. <laughs> there is a Redeemer. There is a Redeemer. There's another one, My Redeemer Lives. I know he's conquered. And there goes on, My Redeemer Lives. And another one, I know my Redeemer liveth, right from the, the words of Job. It's one of the most often used words in Scripture, too. Listen, 
as we just get a lay a foundation here. Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hung on a pole. It says Christ redeemed us from the curse. 1 Peter. You, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. And in heaven, those that will stand together around the throne in heaven sing songs of redemption. It says, and they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. Redemption is a powerful word. And the essential idea behind this word redemption is freedom from slavery. Freedom from slavery. Some of you who like popular music, even um, from the 60s or 70s, you'll remember Bob Marley, his song of redemption, or his redemption song. It was a song of freedom from slavery. And actually, redemption is at, is at the heart of most songs sung by slaves. It's a cry for freedom. Redemption. Richie Havens at Woodstock sang one of the most popular songs of that historic event. He tapped into the, to the psyche of, of a slave, and he sang freedom, and he projected the cry onto the 1960s culture, rallying against the establishment of war in Vietnam. But the essential idea behind this word redemption is freedom from control, freedom from slavery, freedom from domination. But the word redemption in the Bible actually embodies something a little bit deeper yet. To be redeemed means that a price has been paid by someone to release you from slavery. It's not just to be set free. It's that a price has been paid to set you free. It's freedom at a cost. Now going back as far as Jesus and the Apostles... The Roman Empire was at its peak, and there were probably within that empire no less than 50 million slaves. 50 million slaves. Now, it was possible for a slave to slowly save up enough money of his or her own and to purchase their own freedom. It was possible. But more often than not, a master could sell the slave to someone who would pay the price and have them set free. And to have your freedom purchased was to be redeemed. And the price paid was called a ransom. A ransom. And it's from this cultural metaphor, this practice of redemption, that captures what Jesus has done for each of us. First of all, we have to step back and realize that we were slaves. You go, I, I wasn't a slave. Well, from a scriptural framework, yes you were. It teaches us that we were born as slaves to a human nature that is sinful. You were a slave to a sinful nature. John 8, 34, Jesus, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Anyone here who hasn't sinned? Just want to know you're being honest. Then you were a slave to sin. Romans 6.20, when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. You were enslaved to sin. So the Bible talks about being set free from sin. And the thing we need to understand is that from God's perspective, each of us need to be forgiven of our sins so that we are free from the guilt and the consequences of them. What are the consequences? The wages of sin is death, eternal separation from God. Even more than that, we need to be set free from the power that sin has on our life. We all have impulses. We all have desires that don't necessarily resonate with God's holiness, and they can control us. And some people allow that control to go to the nth degree, and they become addicted to certain things. God wants to break the power of those control mechanisms, those sinful impulses in us. He wants to set us free. Now, Rick Warren, 
recalls a time when he was invited to preach in a prison. And there were 5,000 inmates that he was asked to speak to. A little intimidating. He said as he got up to the microphone and everybody in the yard could hear what he was saying, he had 5,000 people that were pretty much not paying attention to anything he said. They were ignoring him. He was just declaration. So he got this incredible idea and he opened up his wallet and he pulled out a $50 bill. And he said, how many of you would like this $50 bill? And immediately he had 5,000 men's attention. They all put up their hands. But then he crumpled the $50 bill and he tore it a bit and he said, how many of you would still like this $50 bill? 5,000 people put up their hands. Then Rick spat on the $50 bill, threw it on the ground, stomped on it, bent over and picked it up again. He said, now, how many of you would like this $50 bill? 5,000 men put up their hands. Rick went on to say, now for many of you, this is exactly what your father or mother or someone did to you. You were mistreated, you were abused, misused, you were told you wouldn't amount to anything, you've done a lot of dumb things, you sinned, you've done some crimes, that's why you're here, you've been beaten, you've been torn, you've been dirty, but you have not lost one cent of your value in God's eyes. That's was a great message. God loves you no matter how messed up you are. And the Bible says that while we were yet sinners, while we were slaves to sin, God sent His Son for us. He did. But make no mistake about it, you were a slave. But then we learn from this redemptive metaphor that freedom comes at a cost. A ransom needs to be paid. And in terms of our sin, the Bible says silver or gold won't cut it. 1 Peter verse 1 verse 18 says that silver or gold is not the price that can be paid. And so what we learn is that Jesus becomes the ransom through his blood. What is the price? It's the blood of Christ. A spiritual payment for a spiritual problem. Jesus becomes the ransom through his blood. The Bible says that Jesus came to give his life as a ransom for many. Ephesians 1 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. And so, the essence of spiritual re redemption is that you and I were bought at a price. And what is the price? The blood of Jesus. Now, I'm going to ask a question. question that I don't know if we have a satisfactory answer for. But I think many of us think about it. Why did God require blood to deal with our sin? What is that all about? I, I personally, I don't really know the fullness of the answer to it. I do know that it says in Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11 that the life of the creature is in the blood. The life of the creatures in the blood. And God says, he goes on to say, I've given it to you as an atonement for yourselves on the altar. Now we know physiologically that blood, as it courses through our veins, cleanses us. It's a cleansing agent. It takes the toxins out of our system. But from God's perspective, there is a blood that cleanses us spiritually too. And because the life of a person is in the blood, blood is the ransom price for spiritual freedom. That's the full extent, as best as we humans can understand. And then as we read the Old Testament, this helps us understand why animals were sacrificed for human sin, which leads us to another big word associated with redemption, and that word is substitution. The animals, in ancient times, as they were sacrificed, were substitutes for the humans. The original image of this is when Abram was taking Isaac up to Moriah to sacrifice him, as God had commanded, but then the ram was in the thicket as a substitute, foreshadowing that one day Christ would become the substitute for us. Instead of us having to die for our own sins, Christ would die in our place 
the sins of humankind would be placed upon him. As it says in Hebrews 7, that he became the sacrifice once and for all. And yet there's another word that relates to this redemptive metaphor, and that is atonement. And the idea behind that is making amends, uh, to repair a wrong done. And in the Bible, it carries the idea of covering. As blood was shed, the human sin was covered temporarily until Jesus and his blood washed our sins away once for all. Another question. So we are slaves to sin, were or are. God gave Jesus as an ultimate ransom to set us free from being a slave to that and the consequences of that. But to whom was the ransom paid? To whom was the ransom paid? It's a big question, isn't it? Did God have to pay off the devil? Ooh, that sounds creepy. The answer to this is summed up in another big word related to redemption, and that is called propitiation. You will find this word used more in the King James Version. It's a legal term, and it's about appeasement. But we still have the question, who and what is being appeased in terms of blood being shed? It's a matter of great discussion and debate, but the answer, I believe, is quite straightforward. God himself. I'm saying that God paid the ransom to appease himself. God's standards of holiness, beyond our comprehension, are so high, we can't earn his mercy or his grace, but God took the initiative by giving us a perfect sacrifice his son, who did not commit any sin, and met the standards of a ransom to set us free. The only satisfaction or propitiation that could be acceptable to God and that could reconcile man to him had to be made by God himself. Jesus, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, was the perfect sacrifice. And so in Revelation, when we sing salvation belongs to our God, we need to understand that salvation belongs to our God. That everything that is provided to us is God's initiative. Salvation is because of Him. And so, this is doctrine made pure and simple. It's about knowing what you believe so that when you sing, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. There is a Redeemer. You can understand that you've been set free from, from the consequences and the power of sin because Jesus has paid a ransom, His life and His blood, to satisfy God's holiness. Well, there's a story. A true story that stems from the Civil War. Before American slaves were freed. And it's about a northerner who went south to purchase a slave, a slave girl. He went to the auction and he purchased this young girl. And as they walked away from the auction, the man turned to the girl and he told her, you're free now. You are free now. He purchased her to set her free. She said, to say whatever I want to say, said, you can say whatever you want to say. I'm, I'm free to do whatever I want to do? Yeah. I'm, I'm free to go wherever I want to go? I said, yes. She looked at him intently and replied, then I'll go with you. That's what we say to Jesus, who has set us free. Then I'll go with you. Bruce Carroll wrote this beautiful song called The Great Exchange. It's talking about God giving us his life to set us free, and we in turn giving us or giving him our life. So once upon a time, or once a time upon a hill far away, an unfair proposition before a righteous man was made. Could have changed the situation. But instead, he chose to obey at the great exchange. An eternity he traveled to be there at that place, 
the chosen destination to show mankind God's grace. His longing to redeem us could only be explained at the great exchange. This is redemption on the bottom shelf. May you understand what God has done and is doing for you. And may it fill your heart to give Him your life back. Heavenly Father, your redemptive love is compelling. We don't pretend to understand it all in entirety. But we understand enough to know that it is true. We do know that a remedy needed to be made, provided for our propensity to do wicked things and to go our own way. We know intuitively that that alienates us from you, the creator of this universe, who is good. And we thank you, God, that you took the initiative through Jesus to become one of us, to be among us, to live a life unlike any other, and to give your life away as a sacrificial man. <coughs> May we now respond in the only way that is right. Forgive us, Lord. Redeem us. And we will follow you. We will go after you.